What's up, Israel? Welcome back to the front line. It's your girl, Shamar. I hope you guys had a good week. Um, I tried to record yesterday, and uh, and I, I don't like to keep coming to you guys with excuses, too. Let me start out by saying that. Um, but yesterday uh, was my son I lost. That was his birthday, and he would have been 31. I recorded twice and kept having tech issues. And I feel like mama was saying, you know what, Shamar? Let's take this day off. You know, um, just take a day and reflect on your son. And while I was at it, I reflected on another son that was lost, guys, who was a part of a group that I was a part of. His name was Raz. Exceptional sons, guys, that mama let mama let us know for a little while. Okay. Speaking of exceptional sons, I'm going to start calling Joshua an uh, exceptional Ephraimite. Yeah, I am. Guys, sometimes I'll bring y'all stuff and y'all will kind of know uh, where we're going this week, right? And I know y'all see that title already, so y'all are like, what in the world are we talking about, Shamar? Well, guys, I'm going to tell y'all something. These these folklores and these fairy tales and all of this stuff got to come from somewhere. I mean, if we're willing to accept that when Joshua entered this promised land, he fought giants, why would we not be willing to accept what else he might have fought? This one, guys, has been on the back burner for a little while. It's something I noticed, but wasn't ready to bring to you guys yet. Till we came back down around to these exceptional Ephraimites, right? Because all we hear about is Judah. It's enough. Look at what Ephraim was doing, guys. I showed you Holder giving out oracles. She's living at the same time as Jeremiah, but she gave the oracle. Oh, it came from Ephraim. I gave you guys Deborah, a judge, had to go to war with a man, tell him to get up, get on out there, this is your time. And we got Joshua. Joshua is fighting things here, guys. He is. Now, I could be wrong, <laughs> but I'm going to bring this evidence to you guys. And y'all tell me what y'all think when it's all said and done. All right? But something was amiss. Let's keep going. Let's, let's get into this folder that I got. And this is my AI design. We got Joshua the Vampire Hunter, guys. My, my AI design. Now, check this out. I want to take you guys to Deuteronomy 12, right? Check this out. Now, when the creator gave instructions, obviously, you don't make a rule up for something that's not happening, right? Who does that? When you make the... I went, I went to the zoo one time, guys, and there was a sign that said, do not kiss the giraffes in the mouth. Okay, so... I don't think that sign came about for no reason, right? Absolutely not. Some jackass kissed a giraffe in the mouth. Okay, you can bet money on it. We do not make signs. What's that? If you sprinkle when you tinkle, be a sweetie and wipe the seedy. They made those signs because people weren't wiping the seed off afterwards. Okay, so the creator comes up with this law. In Deuteronomy 12, 23. Now, why would the creator waste the creator's time coming up with rules um, for the Israelites if there weren't people that were doing these things? So let's talk about this. Deuteronomy 12, 23. We got different translations here, but <laughs> got your drunk unk. Let's go with that one. Uh, only be sure that thou eat not the blood. For the blood is the life. Thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Okay, so the creator 
is telling Israel, don't eat any blood, please, because the blood is the life. You must not eat the life with the meat. So this was in animals. Uh, this is why you'll see them uh, slaughter the animal, but they'll drain it. It's still a practice to this day. You got some nations running around eating blood sausage, right? Uh, so, like I said, the creator ain't going to come up with this rule for no reason. All right. We already saw Joshua fighting giants, right? Coming in and saying that they were giants. Now check this story out. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to break this up into a couple of series. Okay. Cause I don't want to inundate you guys, uh, in one episode. So fair use, uh, YouTube for the purposes of, uh, education and criticism. So we'll try to keep these at uh, 30 minutes top, guys. Okay, so once I see it hits 30 minutes, I'll stop. We'll go to part two. All right, so let's go. Joshua 10. Let's get into it. Also, another reoccurring theme, guys, I want y'all to hold on to that you're going to see is these five kings. Ab Abraham, not Abraham, guys, before he is Abraham. Abraham has a conflict with uh, that involves four kings and five kings. So interesting story there. Now we're going to fast forward and we're going to see a reference to five kings again in Joshua. So pay attention, guys. Now Adonai Zadok, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zadok, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron. You know, that Hohams reminded me of, is that the total Hoham? But anyway, let's keep going. The king of Hebron, which we know that that stands for confederacy, right? Piram, king of Jarmuth. So we're going to get into all of these names in the future, guys. Japhia, king of Lachish. It's another city. And Deber, king of Eglon. You know, if you got free time, start researching these cities. Tell me what you found. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said because it's made peace with Joshua and who? The Israelites. Joshua and the Israelites. No, was it Joshua and Judah? No. No. Joshua and the Israelites, a.k.a. the Ephraimites. Then the five kings of the Amorite, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, we're right here, guys, Lachish and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up position against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us. Because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. It's gone down. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I've given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After all night march, sorry, and all night march <laughs> from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran, to the Freeman town, right? Because Beth Haran means Freeman. And they cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. Remember Makeda, guys. So two things. Remember the five kings. Remember Makeda, guys, okay? As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the sword of Israelites. 
on the late, sorry, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, right? It was done in front of Israel, not behind scenes and Joshua coming back and telling them supposedly what the creator said, right? This is done in front of Israel. So Joshua said, son, stand still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. Now they're going to try to add this as it is written in the book of Jasher, be as, but the book of Jasher starts out with some lies. So I don't, I feel like Judah just added that sentence in, in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we're going to keep going. So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky, delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. All right. So Joshua commands that the sun stand still over Gibeon. And as a result, the sun stayed out a full day, guys. Right. So I say to myself, well, wow, that's that's a pretty interesting thing to want uh, to be able to command. Like if I could command anything, I'd be probably commanding fireballs to come down or something to help me win this fight. So obviously this sun stand out helps him to win a fight somehow. Right, guys? So hold on to that. Now you're going to see why I asked the question, right? All right, so let's keep going. So here go those five Amorite kings, guys. So now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makeda. So they hiding in a cave in a town called Makeda. I wonder what made them go to Makeda. Right, guys? What is it about Makeda? We're going to get there. Uh, when Joshua was told the five kings had been found hiding in the cave, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave. Post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. So he wants them to lock them up in the cave. We're going to come back to y'all. <laughs> okay. Uh, attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hands. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. <laughs> no one uttered a word against Israel. Who was at Makeda that could have uttered a word against Israel? I wonder. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave. The kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, where David is crowned, right? <laughs> Good old Hebron, Confederacy. Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here, put your feet on the neck of these kings. So they came for it and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. Then Joshua put to death and exposed their bodies on five poles. And they were left hanging on the poles until evening. So he took these five kings right? It sounds like uh, hangs them naked even because it says exposes their bodies. He wants their bo bodies to be exposed in the sun. Very interesting. At sunset, Joshua gave the order. They took them down from the poles and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they place large rocks, which are there to this day. Okay. So for some reason, you know, Joshua wants the sun to stay out all day to help him in this fight. 
They hang men on a pole, these kings, that they find in Makeda and expose them to the sun the whole day. All right, let's keep going. Southern cities conquered. What southern cities? What? Southern cities in Makeda. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors, and he did to the king of Makeda as he'd done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and attacked it. So I'm going to spare you guys reading every single city that Joshua went to from passages 28 to 38. But he definitely hit up Hebron. Okay, so do yourselves a favor. Come back and read Joshua 10, 28 to 38. Have yourself a good time because he was wiping people out. Joshua wasn't playing. Joshua had had a, an order and he followed it through. Notice Joshua ain't calling himself no king either. Let's keep going. Let's get down to 40 because this is important. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, huh, over here, the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors, unlike Saul, right, guys, from the tribe of Benjamin? <laughs> he totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings and their lands, Joshua conquered in one campaign, because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Okay, so southern cities conquered. What southern cities? It's a city named Makeda, huh? We're going to get to all of this, guys. Just hold on to those five kings, Makeda, southern cities. Let's keep going. Now, that situation with Joshua reminded me of another situation, right? Because all of this, guys, is painting a picture for me. So let's go to this story right here. Okay, guys, uh, this was a story concerning an event that happened at those brothels I told y'all about where the uh, obligate parasite is, is shared amongst the men of Israel from the daughters of Moab. This is David's people, Moab, right? The daughters, okay? That's where he tucked his parents away at, right? He's either Moab or Judah, but he damn sure ain't Israel. Don't ever forget that one. He wishes he was Israel. You ain't Israel. Let's keep going. You're sick. Every name that was associated with David was linked to a sickness, which I tell you, vampirism is linked to a sickness as well. So let's keep going. And Israel abode in Shittim, this is Numbers 25, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. When you see those Western movies, guys, I'm trying to tell y'all, this is what's happening to Israel. They built those brothels, the Sakaf booths, Sakaf translates to booth, which translates to the brothels they built in this specific incident. So every time you celebrate Sakaf, you're celebrating when Israel's, the men of Israel betrayed Israel. So let's watch this. Chapter, uh, verse two. And they called the people. Oh, no, let's start all over. I can't. I got to keep going. Hold on. And Israel abode in Shittim and the people committed whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their God. Remember when we opened up this chapter, we talked about not drinking the blood. Remember that, guys. And I told you these rules are not written for no reason. So let's see. So people in Moab are sacrificing things to gods. And it says the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. In some places, it'll say initiated itself. So what was Israel engaging in, in here? Besides the whoredom, guys. I got my suspicions. 
And I think this is why they got sick like this. If they were drinking this blood, guys, that would be passing on disease too. So it wasn't just the sexual immorality, guys, is what it's looking like. Uh, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the what? The sun. Where have we seen that before? Hmm? A little movie called Dracula. The creator wanted them hung against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. But did Moses tell him that they were supposed to be hung against the sun? I don't see that. I see Moses telling them to slay him. But it looks like to hang him in the sun would have gotten rid of whatever was amongst Israel. Okay, guys? Let's keep going. The creator knows why the creator asks you to do these things in the specific manner in which you're asked to do them. All right. So I told y'all this hang people up towards the sun. This is the second time I've seen this in the book, guys. Right. So I say to myself, wait a minute. What is going on here? And what were these people sacrificing to their gods? And what was Israel engaging with in these Sakak oofs? Look at this. Psalm 16 and 4. Told you the creator don't make these rules unless there's something going on. Look at this. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names upon my lips. Okay, so offering to other gods, drink offerings of blood, huh? Mm -hmm. That's what they was doing at Baal Peor, those daughters of Moab? Is that what you were over there engaging with? Sons of Israel? Yeah. So I told you these rules don't come for no reason. Now, back to these five kings in a cave, right? Because I want to show you what they were doing and where they were at. Divide and conquer. In the battle story of Joshua 10, the armies of Israel literally seal five kings inside a cave as part of an overall strategy for conquering the land of Canaan. That's why I brought this article in. Down here it says, Joshua killed the kings and hung them on trees so that all could see the enemies of God's people had been defeated. Now, don't this sound like how they how they executed JC2 and the whole cave thing and, and roll away the stone and he's alive? Like what? What? He's alive? What? Guys, listen. It says, uh, yeah, that Joshua hung them on a tree so that they could see the enemies. It says, nah, but it's something about this sun, guys. Anyway, let's go to the definition of Canaan. Because this Canaan came up, right? Land of purple, international trade, international synchronicity. Land of purple. Wasn't that linked to those Phoenicians, guys? Etymology from the term Kananu, purple dye. From the verb Kana. Huh? Kana? <laughs> Oh, a king, kind of, to be brought into synchronicity? Like, you know? Let's keep going. This is going to give you the history of the name Canaan, right, guys? Linked to the Hivites. Etymology. Land of purple. Relates to the Phoenician, right? Means purple. The Hebrew verb kana, it may also have been taken from the Hebrew verb kana and projected back upon this person. Either way, in the biblical context, the name Canaan surely has to do with the Hebrew verb kana, meaning to be brought into synchronicity. That's what those kings do, bring you under subjection. Free yourself, please. The verb kana means to synchronize or to give up, okay? Give up. What it, 
What did Samuel say to the Israelites was going to happen if they select a king? They were going to give up their freedoms. They're going to give up individual leanings in order to unite more effectively as a group. Note that although this verb may have been a negative taste to modern libertarians, this verb sits at the heart of all civilization. Even the very formation of language and sets free rather than enslaved. Sure. Go ahead and believe that one. Let's see. Let's look at this last one. Uh, for a meaning of the name Canaan, the N-O-B-S-E study Bible name list reads low. Jones Dictionary of Old Testament proper names reads merchant or servant. Here at Abram, sorry, publications, we would interpret the name Canaan as international trade or international synchronicity. Sound like Wall Street to me. They built up that wall and others dobbed it over. Lazy Adam doesn't want to work, guys. Now, I want to get to this Makita, and then we're going to stop the video here and uh, go on to part two, guys. I told y'all to remember that Makita, because that's when Joshua is in the southern cities, right? Where'd it go? Joshua is in the southern cities, it says, right? Where'd it go? Southern cities are conquered by who? Joshua. Joshua took what? Makita. Let's go find out what is Makita. Let's go find out, guys. This is going to rock y'all. Check this out. This is what we do over here on the front line. We dig. We don't leave no stone unturned. Let's go. Proper name location. Makita. Derived from an unused root meaning to fold or to enclose. It says there is no direct Greek equivalent for Makita in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, as it is a proper noun specific to a location in the Hebrew Bible. Makita is a place name in the Hebrew Bible, specifically a city in the territory of Judah. <laughs> oh, the tribe of Judah running around doing all kinds of stuff. I try to tell you guys. Look at that. Makeda is in the territory of Judah. It is most notably mentioned in the context of Joshua's conquest of Canaan. The name itself does not carry a specific meaning beyond its identification as a location. Makeda was one of the cities in the southern region of ancient Canaan. During the time of Joshua, it was a significant site due to its strategic location. The city is best known for the event where the five Amorite kings hid in a cave at Makeda. Didn't I tell y'all they hiding in a cave at Makeda? Why, why are they so connected to the southern city of Makeda in Judah? Why are these kings hiding in the southern city in a cave in Judah? After being defeated by Joshua and the Israelites, this event is part of a larger narrative of the Israelite conquest of Canaan, which is a central theme in the book of Joshua, the exceptional book of the Ephraimites, where they don't want to tell you who the Ephraimites are and who they're fighting and why they're fighting. Okay. They just want to join people to Israel. Like some parasites. This event is part of a larger narrative of the Israelite conquest. Not these parasites that keep joining themselves to our nation. Wayward tribes running around stealing people's identity. No. This is Israel, guys. And this is an exceptional Israelite named Joshua doing all of this. The historical context reflects the period of transition from nomadic life to settlement in the promised land, a key phrase in Israelite history. So let's be clear, a place in Judah. This is, this is what Makeda is, guys. 
there you have it. Five kings hiding in a cave. We're not surprised because we see Hebron there. You see Jerusalem there. We're not surprised to see our cousins involved in this. But I'm going to keep on digging on this one, y'all. Watch where we go. All right, so I'm going to stop it here. I'll see you guys. You're free to move on to the next one, okay? Let me stop.